Hello, and welcome to the Emirates Society of Emergency Medicine Emergency Ultrasound Lecture Series. My name is Rasha Buhumaid, and I'll be talking to you briefly about an introduction to point-of-care ultrasound. When we evaluate patients in the emergency department, we use various tools to help us make the diagnosis, including taking a history, examining the patient, ordering some laboratory testing, and other ancillary tests. In some cases, we need to order some imaging, and the options are to order x-rays, CT scans, some, some facilities have an MRI options and ultrasounds. These various imaging modalities vary in terms of their portability, radiation exposure, how easily reproduction, reproducible it is, is it a dynamic study versus not, cost and image quality. And here I'm just gonna compare between them. When you look at x-rays, you know, some facilities have portable x-rays, but many hospitals don't. Radiation, there is some radiation exposure, minimal compared to others. It's not that easily rep uh, reproducible. It's not a dynamic study. And there is some cost, not as expensive as other imaging modalities. And the quality of imaging is, de is decent, depending on how well the patient is cooperating with uh, getting the x-ray. When you compare to CT scan, you see definitely it's not reproducible. There's more radiation exposure. It's definitely more expensive. On the other hand, MRI is not readily available in many of the facilities. Uh, first of all, because it is, um, takes a while. And other, other than that, it's expensive, although it gives us very high imaging quality. When you compare it to ultrasound, you can see that ultrasound is is portable, it's easily reproducible, it's more dynamic, and it is not as expensive. And let's not forget to mention that the radiation exposure is definitely minimal. But the trick with the ultrasound is that the imaging quality really depends on the uh, sonographer. So that's the only uh, the tricky part when you compare ultrasound with other imaging modality. Point of care ultrasound is uh, also known as limited, you will you will read uh, you will you might find it in other sources as focused bedside emergency or clinician performed ultrasound. They all mean the same thing. They're performed at the point of care, read uh, uh, with real time applications of findings. There are various components of point of care ultrasound, including image acquisition. That means actually obtaining the images and then interpreting these images and incorporating them into the patient care. Let's compare between when we order a comprehensive imaging modality or ultrasound comparing to a point of care ultrasound. When you order a comprehensive ultrasound, you place the order, the technician performs the ultrasound, the radiologist reads the uh, images and then gives you the report and you try to incorporate that into the patient's care. On the other hand, point of care ultrasound, you are the physician and you are the technician who performs it as well as you are the radiologist who interprets it and incorporates it in patient care. I think there's a great value uh, that adds to the patient care when you are able to perform it first because you first ask the question and you try to perform the ultrasound to answer that question and incorporate it in patient's care. Some more points when you compare comprehensive ultrasound to point-of-care ultrasound. Obviously, comprehensive ultrasound is time-consuming. You can see all these steps. You place the order that you need to call the tech. Sometimes the tech is not in-house, and the radiologist has to read the images. They give you lots of information uh, because they actually have a specific pro protocol that they have to go through, even if you are looking for something very specific in the study. And there might be some information loss because the technician actually performs the study and the radiologist is not physically there. So there is some uh, possibilities of information loss. When you compare it to point of care ultrasound, it is immediate because you are performing it at bedside and you can correlate it clinically because the patient, the patient is physically in front of you and you know what specific question you're trying to answer. And they're usually very dichotomous. That means it's a yes or no. Does this patient have pericardial effusion? Yes or no. And our questions are very focused because you, we are 
point of care. So you have a specific question that you're trying to answer when you perform a study. In addition, there are other applications and out of, uh, outside the scope of emergency uh, care, including pre-hospital pre wilderness, rural medicine, uh, and uh, developing countries, uh, as well as medical schools. It's becoming more and more um, interesting field incorporating point-of-care ultrasound in medical education. Many of you will raise this question, isn't ultrasound for radiologists only? And the answer to this question is no. And I'm going to take you through some evidence behind that. So for the past decades, radiologists, I mean obstetricians, as well as cardiologists have been using point-of-care ultrasound in their practice. And in 1999, the uh, American uh, Medical Association passed a resolution 802 that stated that all medical specialties have the right to use ultrasound in accordance with specialty specific practice standards. And in 2001, the AIUM created a section for emergency ultrasound. So emergency medicine has been the leader of the use of point of care ultrasound education and research. And there are other medical specialties, including critical care, anesthesia, have been catching up with the trend. In 2011, uh, this is a great paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine on the use of point of care ultrasound in various specialties. And here is the, and this is a table from the paper that summarizes the list of medical specialties as well as their ultrasound application. I think this is a big win and a bonus that placed the point of care ultrasound in the map of uh, medical specialties. So what are the ultrasound applications or point of care ultrasound applications that uh, are used in the emergency department? In 2001, the American College of Emergency Physicians published the ultrasound guidelines and they listed seven different applications uh, for point of care ultrasound, including trauma or the extended fast exam, emergency echocardiography, intrauterine pregnancy evaluation, evaluation for an abdominal aortic aneurysm, biliary ultrasound, renal ultrasound, and procedural guidance. So these uh, uh, guidelines were updated in 2008 and the American College of Emergency Physicians added other core applications to the list. So right now we have 11 applications. So they added DVT, soft tissue, musculoskeletal, thoracic and ocular ultrasound. In addition, in 2011, uh, American College of Emergency Physicians added some advanced application of point-of-care ultrasound that are more used for experienced providers, including nerve block, bowel or GI ultrasound, advanced echocardiogram, testicular ultrasound, and transcranial. So you can see that the evolution of point-of-care ultrasound and the various applications that have been added since 2001. So we talked so far that the point of care ultrasound has many advantages, including the fact that it is dynamic, it is safe, it is portable, reproducible. There are so many different applications that you can use it. Some providers care about the core three big ED points, which is patient satisfaction, efficiency, as well as cost savings. And there are multiple various studies that prove that point of care ultrasound improves patient satisfaction, improves if, uh, emergency physician's efficiency, as well as helps in cost savings. And we're going to go through some papers in brief and the evidence behind that. In this study, they found out by that by simply putting the probe on the patient, you can automatically improve your chance of being liked by the patient. They found that patients who had a bedside ultrasound had a statistically significant higher satisfaction scores with the overall ED care, diagnostic testing, and with their perception of their emergency physician. This is an important for emergency departments that rely on satisfaction surveys for hospital fundings or for other purposes. In this patient, in this study, they found that the length of stay in the emergency department dramatically decreases 
uh, thus increasing patient satisfaction uh, while maintaining an even higher standard of care when analyzing the use of emergency ultrasound in various hospitals in the US. So this tells us that the use of ultrasound helps with efficiency. This is another paper on the use of point of care ultrasound making the diagnosis of DVT, DVT in the emergency department. They found that emergency physicians can decrease the time to disposition by almost 125 minutes when performing their own ultrasound examination of the lower extremity to rule out DVT rather than relying on the radiologist performed studies. And this paper was done in a hospital that had a 24-hour uh, ultrasound a radiologist at uh, site. So this tells you in, in sites where you don't have ultrasound available, this is going to be even better utilization of the, patient, uh, the patient's time and the hospital's time. So it helped with quicker disposition, less resource utilization, less nurse time, less observation, and faster time to make the diagnosis. So this definitely is another proof that point-of-care ultrasound improves efficiency. How about cost saving? In this study, uh, they looked at the financial impact of starting emergency department ultrasound divisions and ultrasound programs, and they found that an emergency department ultrasound program that captures charges from trauma and procedural ultrasound can break even in less than five years, and at which point they can, it would generate a positive margin after that. This is another study uh, looking at uh, the cost saving question is that during they implemented the use of point of care ultrasound program and during the post implementation period when they implemented QPath to help them augment billing and coding um, by the faculty that did ultrasound in the emergency department, they found that the post implementation period the facility fees revenue increased sevenfold and the professional fees revenue increased by 6.3 fold. After deducting the capital cost and ongoing operational costs from, approximate, uh, from the approximate collection, the net profit gained by the emergency department ultrasound program was approximately $3,500,000. This is important for the department's financial planning if they're planning on starting the point-of-care ultrasound program. This is another paper that showed that emergency physicians who performed emergency ultrasound in their clinical practice received uh, statistically higher RVUs than emergency physicians who rarely or do not use emergency ultrasound in their practice. The use of point-of-care ultrasound in medical student education have been increasing in the past few years. Uh, and these, there are a number of studies that shows that incorporating focused ultrasonography training into medical school curriculum is one possible way to adhere to training recommendation without increasing the educational requirement for residency program. And it also showed that it enhances anatomy understanding and safety. So this is another paper on Med, uh, use of point-of-care ultrasound in medical student education and that concluded that as a sign of a growing need for ultrasound education within the medical education system, a large group of professional organizations including the American College of Emergency Physicians, the American College of Surgeons, and the American College of Physicians advocate the role of physicians should, uh, should be to perform and interpret focused ultrasound examinations. So I think we've gone through various papers that proves that the point of care ultrasound helps with patient satisfaction, efficiency, as well as cost saving and medical education and importance of the use of point of care ultrasound in medical education. In the next few slides, we will be discussing some cases of the applications of point of care ultrasound in the emergency department. 24 years old male, brought in by ambulance after a motor vehicle crash with abdominal pain. Blood pressure is 85 over 50, heart rate is 120, so clearly this patient is um, unstable. 
you want to try and evaluate the patient quickly and you decided to perform a point of care uh, abdominal ultrasound looking if there's any free fluid. And this is what you see. So this is an image of the right upper quadrant showing some free fluid in the abdomen. Doing this within the first five minutes of the patient's presentation to the emergency department, you can help expedite this patient's care. The image on the right represents a normal right upper quadrant ultrasound showing no free fluid. So with this patient who had a positive FAST exam, you can exponentially expedite this patient's care in the emergency department and help with appropriate disposition. A 44-year-old female who presents with shortness of breath, dyspnea on exertion, who's tachycardic to 125 and borderline hypotensive 94 over 62. You perform a point of care ultrasound of the chest and this is what you see. So the clip shows that the pleural line, which is this white line between the two rib shadows, is not sliding. There is absence of lung sliding. This in the right clinical setting is showing that this patient could have a pneumothorax. The image on the right side shows a normal lung sliding where you can see this pleural line sliding right to left with normal respiration. So in this case, using point of care ultrasound, you can rapidly make the diagnosis of pneumothorax and treat the patient appropriately. Another case, 18 years old who comes in stabbed in the chest with a butcher knife. The first thing you do, obviously evaluate the ABC in this trauma patient, and the first ultrasound application, you want to make sure this patient does not have a tamponade. So you perform a bedside ultrasound, and this is what you see. So here you can clearly see that the, the, the patient's tachycardic, and there is anechoic or black fluid surrounding the heart. And Expeditely, you can make the diagnosis of pericardial tamponade. On the right side, you can see an, um, a, no a normal parasternal lung image with no evidence of any pericardial effusion. So you're able to make the diagnosis of traumatic uh, tamponade based on point-of-care ultrasound and really help this patient's rapid uh, disposition and appropriate care. So the next case is an 82 years old female with a past history of uh, acute myocardial infarction, diabetes, who presents to the emergency department dysnic, altered, and hypotensive. So the differential diagnosis is absolutely broad, but one of the most important applications in patient who comes to the emergency department with undifferentiated shock is to perform a focused echocardiography, and this is what was done. This is the image. This shows basically the patient's ventricular function is extremely poor. And with, in comparison to a normal parasternal lung, where you can see the left ventricular function and contraction normally, you can expeditely make the diagnosis of cardiogenic shock. And you can narrow your differential diagnosis based on your um, point of care ultrasound and give the patient the appropriate management. The next case is a 67 years old male smoker who presents with abdominal pain who's hypotensive and tachycardic. Obviously, there are multiple different differentials that goes through your mind evaluating this sick patient. And one of the most important things that you should make sure that you are able to rule out is an abdominal aortic aneurysm. So you perform a bedside ultrasound and this is what you see. So the abdominal aorta is definitely enlarged where there's intramural thrombus. So within the first few minutes of evaluating this patient, you can rule in or rule out an abdominal aortic aneurysm if you perform a bedside ultrasound. In comparison with a normal aorta, which is seen on the right, you can make the diagnosis of an abdominal aortic aneurysm. And we know this is a ticking bomb and having the rapid diagnosis is very crucial and very helpful for the patient. The next case is a 26 years old female who is eight weeks pregnant with pelvic pain and bleeding. So you perform a bedside ultrasound and this is what you see. So this ultrasound shows that there's no definitive signs of an intrauterine pregnancy. 
This makes us worried that this patient could have an ectopic pregnancy. So depending on the clinical presentation, um, you can expedite the involvement of the gynecology uh, consulting team if the patient is hemodynamically unstable and you don't see a definitive IUP because you can't really rule out an ectopic pregnancy. The image on the right side shows what a normal intrauterine pregnancy should look like using a transvaginal ultrasound. So in this case, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, you can't really rule out an ectopic and you can expedite consulting the um, GYN service. The next is a 40-year-old female who was involved in a motor vehicle crash who is hypotensive, tachycardic, and tachypneic. Obviously, this patient is unstable, and we want to know why. So you perform a focused assessment of sonography and trauma, and this is what you see. So this is an image of the right upper quadrant involving the diaphragm, and you don't see any obvious free fluid in Morrison's bond, but you can see a large amount of anechoic or black fluid collection above the diaphragm. When you compare it with what a normal um, right upper quadrant image looks like, you can see above the diaphragm, you can see just um, air that is what a normal aerated lung looks like. So in this case, you can quickly make the diagnosis of hemothorax and rule out other uh, possible causes of the hypotension and perform a chest tube and help the patient's care. Next case is a 50 years old female with right upper quadrant pain, nausea, vomiting. And you are concerned that this could be, uh, you know, gallstones, but unfortunately you work in a rural hospital where you don't have ultrasound coverage. You perform a bedside ultrasound and this is what you see. So this image you can see a large number of um, stones within the gallbladder that are shadowing. So you can easily make the diagnosis of gallstones. When you compare it to the image on the right side, this is what a normal gallbladder looks like. So this is a great tool for emergency physicians uh, to have, especially in the setting where you don't have ultrasound coverage. The next case is a 60 years old male presenting with leg pain and edema. He has a history of recent travel, it's a long distance travel, uh, the past week and no history of trauma. So you're obviously you're concerned one of your differential is a DVT and you perform a bedside ultrasound and this is what you see. This is the right common femoral vein that is not compressible. When you compare it with a normal ultrasound of the uh, DVT, you can see that the common femoral vein and the greater saphenous vein is nice and compressible. So you can perform quick bedside ultrasound and expedite the diagnosis and make it very quickly. The next case is a 42 years old male who presents with dyspnea and has history of hip surgery a week ago. So the differential diagnosis for patient with dyspnea, you know, could be different. One of the risk factors this patient has is a recent surgery, so you obviously think of pulmonary embolism. Can, you can use the point of care ultrasound to look for signs of right ventricular strain. So you perform a bedside echocardiography and this is what you see. So the image on uh, the upper image shows a parasternal short with evidence of increased um, pressure on the right side with a D sign from the right ventricle compressing the left ventricle and the image on the right in apical four chamber shows a dilated right ventricle. When you compare it to a normal uh, images, so the upper parasternal short shows a normal circular left ventricle and the right ventricle it looks nice and small, so the interventricular symptom is circular. When you compare it with in, in this patient, the, the interventricular septum is bowing towards the left ventricle, sign of a right ventricular strain. On the other hand, on the right, on the right lower image is a normal apical fourth chamber. You see that the left ventricle is larger than the right ventricle. This is normal. When you compare it in this patient, the right ventricle is dilated. So in the right clinical setting, with these findings of right ventricular uh, strain, you can expedite and the care of this patient and definitely push up pulmonary embolism higher in your differential diagnosis. 
The next case is a 25-year-old female who is an IV drug abuser who presents with arm pain, redness, uh, at the site of prior injections. So, you know, you perform a bedside ultrasound to see is this an abscess, is this cellulitis, and this is what you see. So you can clearly see that there is an abscess with this uh, collection of echogenic material um, surrounding a thrombosed uh, peripheral vein. So this can definitely help you manage this patient and tailor the care according to your ultrasound findings. On the other hand, on the right side is what you see in a cellulitis, where you can see some fluid collection within the subcutaneous tissue instead of an abscess, which is represented on the left side. So you can tailor your management based on your ultrasound findings, and you can use ultrasound to support your diagnosis. So you can Definitely use ultrasound in evaluating soft tissue to differentiate between cellulitis and abscess. The next case is a 36 years old male who's complaining of flank pain, nausea, and vomiting. The patient clearly looks very uncomfortable, and one of your differential is renal colic. And you perform a bedside ultrasound looking at the kidney, and this is what you see. So this image shows that the renal pelvis is dilated and black with some fluid collection in it indicating that there is some obstruction and when you compare it to a normal renal ultrasound on the right side with a normal renal pelvis you can make the diagnosis of hydronephrosis and depending on the presentation you can choose whether this patient needs to have a further imaging or not based on your ultrasound finding and the clinical presentation. The next case is an 18 year old uh, was sewing and jabbed the needle in her finger. A few days later, she presents because of increased swelling and edema. You perform a bedside ultrasound and you can actually see the foreign body and you can use the ultrasound to actually help you guide the removal of foreign body. So the, the, uh, the use of ultrasound here can help you instead of going blindly looking for the foreign body, you can actually guide the foreign body removal and diagnosis using the point of care ultrasound. Next is an 88 years old female with a history of congestive heart failure and COPD who comes to the emergency department with severe shortness of breath, tachypneic, hypoxic, wheezing bilaterally. Your differential diagnosis here, obviously we see these patients all the time and your differential, this could be pulmonary edema versus a COPD exacerbation. And you, you know, you can use ultrasound to help you differentiate both of one from the other. And you perform a thoracic ultrasound on this patient and this is what you see. So you can see there are multiple B lines originating from the pleural line and this can help you identify that this patient is in pulmonary edema rather than just a COPD exacerbation. So the image on the right side is a normal uh, thoracic ultrasound on a patient. So you can tailor your diagnosis here to pulmonary edema rather than doing COPD. So this is a quick study that you can perform and help alter the care and the management of the patient in the emergency department. Your next patient is a famous sumo wrestler who gets unconscious after two rounds. He's brought to the emergency department hypotensive and has no IV access. Um, the nursing team and EMS try to get the IV, but obviously, you know, with this body habit, it is really challenging. And using a landmark techniques can be very, very hard. You can easily use bedside ultrasound to help evaluate the anatomy and um, guide the uh, procedure. The clip demonstrates the use of point-of-care ultrasound um, in performing a central line in this case. So we've gone through a number of cases that demonstrate that point-of-care ultrasound help narrow your differential diagnosis, expedite making your diagnosis and therefore providing the accurate uh, management um, and also guides the procedure and we, go, we went through two examples getting a central line as well as guiding removal of a foreign body. What's the optimal way to use point-of-care ultrasound? So you can use it 
anytime you want to see inside. It's a great for ruling things in, not really for ruling things out because like I said, we use point of care ultrasound to answer very specific focused questions. There's no risk of putting the probe on the patient, but obviously there's a risk if you're gonna make decisions based on what you see. Therefore, if you're going to make any decision based on your ultrasound finding, it's much better to err on the side of caution. So some take home points. Remember, ultrasound is risk free. Think of the opportunities to use ultrasound when you see your patients. Practice makes perfect. So it's very important that you actually perform a number of cases. And when you practice, whenever you're uh, you're already getting a complementary comprehensive study. So you can compare your findings based on the comprehensive findings and therefore you will increase your level of confidence on your point of care ultrasound findings. Remember, ultrasound saves time, saves radiation, saves money, and saves life. And keep practicing because that's the only thing that's going to improve your point of care ultrasound skills. Here are some references that were used in this talk. Thank you for your attention.